Okay, so um, today I'm going to be talking about creativity and mental illness, creativity and madness, commonly discussed. Anyway, so uh, the idea is this. So romantic authors uh, saw creative genius as close to madness since madness frees the mind from constraints and conventions and allows truly original thoughts to flourish. So I look at the evidence for the frequently remarked on correlation between madness and creativity. Is there such a correlation? And if so, does it confirm the romanticist view of the relationship between the two? In fact, I'll only be able to do part of that, but we will, we'll, we'll get reasonably far on this. So, okay, um, according to uh, Coleridge, the purpose of art is uh, to give the charm of novelty to things of every day and to excite a feeling analogous to the supernatural by awakening the mind's attention from the lethargy of custom and directing it to the loveliness and wonders of the world before us. So the romanticist conception of aesthetic experience requires that the individual frees herself from custom, socially acquired attitudes and values and becomes one with the object of her attention. So the latter idea is, uh, that demand is articulated by Keats' idea of negative capability, the capability to free oneself from one's self-conception and self-consciousness, and thereby to acquire in feeling and emotion the characteristics of other things. The latter, would often be other things in nature, for example, Wordsworth's you know, lonely cloud, uh, but it needn't be. So Keats could imagine the delight that a billiard ball uh, might take in its own roundness and smoothness and rapid motion, and as well as, of course, the minds of other people. Okay, um, so self-consciousness is to be avoided because it gets in the way of identification with the other, uh, and because it is the product of one's upbringing and of the society in which one finds oneself. Now, romanticism, of course, didn't reject the self. On the contrary, the romantics put great store by self-realization. But that, again, meant realization of the true self, not a personality molded by custom and social expectations. So what conditions, then, would enable awakening the mind's attention from the lethargy of custom? or would free the mind from social expectations, thereby enabling it to feel at one with nature or to realize and thereby to express the true self. Um, a return to childhood was uh, one route, drugs were another route and madness was a third. So what these routes share in common is that they either lack the constraints of conforming self-consciousness or release the individual from those constraints. Uh, in either case, the imagination is thereby also released while at the same time allowing the individual to realize her true self. The child, uh, for example, has yet to be molded by society. The Romantics took an essentially Rousseauian view of childhood, uh, just as man is born free, but is everywhere in chains, a child's imagination is unconstrained, but that of an adult is the product of social conditioning. Hallucinogenic and other drugs were thought, according to this view, to free the adult mind. Madness does so too, while also insulating the mind from conditioning. According to a long tradition exemplified by Foucault, madness just is nonconformity, and avoiding conformity is precisely what the creative imagination must do in order to create true art, says the Romantic. So according to this view, we would expect to find a correlation between creativity and madness. There is a long tradition of seeing such a correlation, exemplified by observations such as Dryden's, great wits are sure to madness near allied, and thin partitions do their bounds divide. Or Byron's, we of the craft are all crazy. Some are affected by gaiety and others by melancholy but all are more or less touched. Recently, the anecdotal evidence has been supplemented by more systematic studies purporting to establish such correlations. Uh, so this talk I'm giving now is uh, examining this evidence. 
uh, and considering the evidence. It's important to note the existence of such correlations is not sufficient to establish the romanticist point since correlation is not causation. And the romanticist claim is a causal one. It's because the man mad are less bound by convention and precedent that there are mere imaginations are free to be especially creative. What we shall see is that there is some, but not yet conclusive evidence of some link between being a creative professional and the chance of suffering from some kind and degree of affective disorder. And insofar as there is a correlation, it's difficult to see that it is the disorder that bring back, brings about a gain in creative powers. Okay, so that's my conclusion. Essentially, it's a negative, boring, anti-romanticist one, but yeah, that's the truth. Um, okay, so look at some of the anecdotal evidence. Um, now, it's easy to bring to mind individual artists who can Firm the proposed link between creativity and mental illness. Vincent van Gogh, uh, Virginia Woolf, Miles Davis, Robert Schumann, Tennessee Williams, and so on. The list is, goes on. Um, this extends beyond the arts. Nietzsche is a prominent case in philosophy, obviously. Uh, the famous image of Albert Einstein. Oh, look here, I can do some screen sharing. Here we go. This famous image, remember that one? Uh, yeah, wild, mild, yeah, yeah, often reproduced, looking uh, with wild hair, tongue sticking out, illustrating the stereotype of the mad scientist. Uh, cases such as Henry Cavendish's autism and John Nash's paranoid schizophrenia provide uh, further anecdotal evidence from the sciences. Now, such piecemeal uh, instances provide evidence of very limited work. Uh, for every artist touched with madness, one can find another endowed with perfectly ordinary sanity. Dante, Shakespeare, Rembrandt, Wren, Bach, and Goethe were all individuals of unsurpassed creative genius, but who showed no signs of mental illness. The same can be said of the greatest scientists and philosophers, Hegel, Hume, Lavoisier, Maxwell, and so on. For every romantic poet of wild and unpredictable behavior, there is an artistic genius of impeccably dull habits. So here's a description of Henrik Ibsen's daily routine. In summer, he rose at seven, a little later in the winter. He dressed slowly and spent a whole hour in the bathroom, following this with a light breakfast before sitting down to work at nine. When the hands of the clock showed one o'clock, he went out for a walk returning for the main meal of the day at three o'clock. Afterwards, he would read. Supper was at seven, followed by a toddy and bed at nine. Ibsen sat sloundly, was rarely ill, and had a healthy appetite. So it just occurred to me, of course, much the same could be said about Kant. Um, so, yeah. yeah, anecdotal and individual evidence, you know, you, we, can, we can pick and choose one way or the other. Furthermore, it can be, um, ambiguous and liable to biased interpretation. Mild eccentricity or the vicissitudes of life can be read as a sign of mental illness if viewed through the stereotype of madness as a facet of genius. Uh, despite the wild picture, Einstein was not at all mentally ill. Beethoven has been diagnosed by one psychiatrist as suffering from bipolar disorder on the ground that he experienced some periods of great productivity, uh, while at other times he would be depressed for several weeks at a time. While that could be bipolar disorder or cyclothymia, it could equally be seen as the record of, a of the psychological ups and downs that are a feature of many people's lives. These peaks and troughs may have been more intense for a creative genius such as Beethoven, whose life was focused pretty much on one thing only is music. Uh, when he felt productive, he would have been especially motivated to compose. When things were not going so well, he would have found that particularly frustrating and depressing in a non-clinical sense. It would be misleading to class that as bipolar disorder, yet the paradigm of the tortured romantic genius might tempt one to succumb to confirmation bias and to accept that diagnosis. As Schlesinger points out, um, uh, the biographers whose work we rely on in assessing the mental health of you know, historical figures have their own agendas. And as she says, 
many writers are likely to emphasize and even exaggerate the struggles and afflictions of the people they write about. Um, so cases such as Beethoven, as I've described it, reveal two other related questions. First, are we mistaking uh, other personality characteristics that one might find in successful individuals for mental illness? And secondly, does the ease with which one can make a diagnosis of mental illness undermine the interest of any link between creativity and mental illness established thereby? So, uh, many successful individuals are highly motivated and ambitious. That's just a truism. A gifted individual who lacks, in individu lacks motivation will, on average, be less productive than an equally gifted individual who is highly ambitious. And so that person is less likely to enter into the canon of great artists or scientists. Producing great work is often intrinsically rewarding. Knowing that one is the best in one's chosen field is a powerful motivator. The admiration of one's peers is also highly motivating, as are the rewards of wider fame and success. At the same time, the effort required to remain at the peak of one's field can be considerable. Yeah, tell me about it. Sorry. Um, um, so an unusually gifted individual has every reason to focus their attention on their work to the exclusion of all else. It's therefore not surprising that many great artists and thinkers are often self-centered and antisocial in their habits. Furthermore, society tends to be more tolerant of such behavior when it's found in a genius than when it's displayed by an individual of more ordinary talents. Even philosophers discuss whether Gauguin's genius excused his abandonment of his family. Eccentric and emotional behavior are parts of the stereotypes of a genius scientist, artist, or poet, and for that very reason might be more readily expressed or even adopted by people in those professions than amongst those who find themselves employed as accountants or bricklayers, amongst whom signs of mental instability will be suppressed being held to be stigmatizing or unprofessional. Creative types are typically educated and articulate, especially if they are writers and so able to express their problematic inner states more effectively. So talented individuals may even be rewarded for selfish or other aberrant behavior because it allows them to concentrate on pursuing artistic success. And they are likely, less likely, they're rather less likely to face the social sanctions that would uh, normally follow, uh, follow uh, because that behavior conforms to a stereotype of creative genius. Consequently, considering borderline cases of mental disorder, one might expect overdiagnosis amongst creative individuals and underdiagnosis amongst the rest of the population. At the same time, artistic success depends upon the approval of others and artistic fame can be fickle. So even great artists are often under considerable pressure to work yet harder while living with the risk that society will not value them and their work as much as it once did. They therefore will suffer the stress of overwork and the anxiety of possible failure. Despite their talents, they may be prone to self-doubt, unduly focused on finding and displaying marks of success and especially sensitive to criticism. Consequently, one might expect such individuals to display some of the symptoms of one or more of the personality disorders, disorders such as schizoid, schizotypal, narcissistic, or even antisocial personality disorder. Um, such symptoms tend, include a tendency to solitariness, a difficulty in forming close relationships, behaving in a way that is indifferent to the harms caused to other, so, uh, and a belief in one's own superiority, but also excessive sensitivity to criticism. So it might well be uh, that while many well-known creative artists did display the symptoms of mental disorder, those symptoms are not in fact the effects of those disorders, but are instead uh, are the effects of the combination of an unusual talent um, and a high degree of motivation on the one hand, uh, and the way that society is organized on the other. If this combination, Kind of, you know, th their talent, motivation, and you know, social expectations mimics mental disorder in some respects, but does not constitute it. 
there is a retrospective overdiagnosis of mental disorder and consequently there is an appearance of a correlation between mental disorder and creativity where there is none. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I mean, there's a possibility that as well, you might want to reinterpret that as saying, actually, these conditions create mental disorder. I mean, that, that makes these people disordered. Uh, and that might be the case. But in, e e even if you took that view, it'd still be the case it's that it's the creativity that causes the disorder, not that the disorder creates the create, causes the creativity, which is the romanticist uh, point, point uh, or argument. Okay. Um, a common conception of madness is that it's an unusual condition. Madness is rare, genius is rare. Um, yet we now know that mental illness is really in fact quite common. That difference is in part due to different definitions of what counts as mad or mentally ill, as well, as well as other changes and you know, such as reduced stigma. As definitions of mental disorder become more inclusive, findings of a correlation between mental disorder and creativity become less revealing, especially as regarding this romanticist hypothesis. Um, we wish to understand the nature of genius, which is very rare, or, arti art or artistic creativity of a professional quality, which is not quite so rare, but still uncommon, uh, then a correlation with an uncommon madness would be revealing. But a correlation with a condition shared with, say, up to a quarter of the population, um, you know, which you know, is the pop roughly the proportion of the population, according to some views, that does suffer at some point or other from mental illness. But that would tell us, seem to tell us very little. Um, if the cases of mental illness amongst past great artists or scientists are augmented by speculative readings of history or by diagnoses less stringent uh, than would be used in a psychiatrist's clinic, then the correlation is even less interesting. Okay, um, so I'm going to pause a little bit there because what I'm now going to do, or what I'm next going to do, is to um, uh, look at affective and mood disorders uh, in particular and look at some of these little bit more systematic evidence uh, that uh, well, we get, in particular, we get in the paper from Kay Redfield uh, Jameson. Um, so the first thing to do is just perhaps I'll pause um, and see whether anybody has anything uh, in, they, they want to, to say or offer or query or criticise. And you can either type a message or you can unmute yourself and say something. Hi, Phil Shields here. I was, I was wondering, I've read the Jameson bit, and I just, the one word I picked up on, on, on a lot of what was said, I, I felt it was quite anecdotal rather than scientific or even particularly philosophical. But she says, uh, or oh, I don't know, is it she? I don't know why I decided. Yeah, she's the she, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Without regular treatment, the disease eventually becomes less responsive to medication. So, I just wondered, you know, with the, what is a mental disorder, how she's classing it. She being strict and saying it has to be some kind of physical problem that creates a mental problem, or does she talk about what she's, how she identifies mental disorder or mental illness? Um, well, that I think is that's a good question, and I think it's one of the things that I think is a. Uh, Weakness, and in fact, I'll, I'll, I'm get, since I'm going on to just talk about um, Kay Jameson's paper in a little more detail in the next next section. Perhaps I, I won't dwell on this for much, for much. And so, um, so she does. You see that you'll see there are two parts of the paper. Well, I mean, there's several parts, but the bits I concentrate on one in which she uses you know, getting treat, getting professional help. Uh, either from you know, a, a psych psychiatrist or a therapist um, is is one um, 
criterion that she uses. So in some some ways, as it were, she is sort of bypassing you know, the need for her to define mental illness. She's just saying, look, have you been treated for one of these disorders? Um, but on the other, but as we'll see, the other thing that she does is, is talk about um, hypomania um, and cyclothymia and. You, there, you know, I think that there's a really genuine question about what counts as a mental disorder and you know, whether uh, you know, what it is that she thinks is is going on. I'm I'm not sure I can relate that directly to what you were saying about um, uh, you know, whether it's responsive to treatment or whether there's an underlying. Uh, by medical, you know, physical, you know, call, calls. I, I think she says, she says even less about about that. I think I'm able to uh, respond uh, specifically to that uh, uh, comment. Um, I think what she's referring to is is the empirical evidence uh, for uh, the the course of uh, bipolar disorder, and and it seems that there is indeed some empirical evidence that uh, shows that uh, the number of episodes, the uh, time that you've been treated, is a, a strong indicator of the uh, outcome of the illness, of the daily uh, capacity of the function. So I think it's. Uh, it's the kind of uh, common uh, empirical uh, evidence that we take for granted uh, in psychiatry that the, the the more you do a, a episode, the the um, the the more you have mania, the more difficult they will be uh, to treat. The more they will be unresponsive to treatment. So I think it's it's she's uh, but she, you're right that she's not uh, citing any clear uh, literature on that. But it's it's really more uh, I guess an empirical uh, claim. Thanks, thanks, Danny. Um, good. Um, I'll, I'm about to move on to the next section, so I'll talk about the Redfield, uh, K. Redfield Jameson paper in a little bit of detail in just a moment. But let you let me know if there's anybody who wants to say anything um, else now. Okay, good. Um, great. Okay, I'll go on. Um, okay, so. Um, what was I going to do? Where am I? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Robert Schumann. So, so I'm going to talk about the the, the um, it's slightly more systematic evidence in, in a moment, but I'm going to start where, by talking about Schumann because I, I like Schumann. Um, so um, Robert Schumann um, died at the age of 46 in an asylum for the insane. Um, Two years later, uh, two years earlier, rather, two years earlier, he had uh, attempted suicide uh, famously by throwing himself into the, the Rhine. Um, and towards the end of his life, Schumann experienced auditory hallucinations uh, of angels and of devils. Um, he had suffered several periods of very marked depression, but at other times he was far from unhappy, enjoying months of elevated mood. Several of Schumann's closest relations had serious mental illnesses. His sister Emily was, or Emilia, was uh, mentally ill from the age of 17 and uh, killed herself by drowning at the age of 29. Uh, and his son Ludwig spent 30 years in an asylum. Um, so biographers have attempted di to diagnose Schumann's illness uh, retrospectively. Uh, some have focused on diagnosing uh, Emilia and Ludwig as having uh, dementia praecox, which we now, you know, which is what we would call uh, schizophrenia, um, and on the hallucinations of Schumann's final years and have declared that Schumann too was schizophrenic throughout his adult life. Um, a rather different but more plausible diagnosis is that he suffered from cyclothymia uh, from, an, uh, from early adulthood um, but th that his later illness is not that, but a result of general paresis, i.e. syphilis. Um, and to that might be added the claim that his terminal illness was in part due to mercury poisoning, a consequence of attempting to treat the syphilis. Okay. So, um, and so on, on this view, 
for much of his life, Schumann had cyclothymia, a disorder that is similar to bipolar disorder, but less intense. There are periods of strong uh, positive feelings, uh, hypomania, um, hypomania being like mania, but you know, hypo being le less than full uh, mania. So it's, it's your mania, but you without the, the, sort of the psychotic bits, roughly speaking. I will talk more about that in a moment. That, that alternating with periods of depression, uh, which though not, you know, but not se severe enough to be classified as you know, full-on clinical depression. Uh, or, um, okay, so some authors have pointed to Schumann as exemplifying the link between you know, affective mood disorders and creativity. And we're talking about Jameson here, really, uh, and others. Um, indeed, some have held Schumann to exhibit manic depressive illness, uh, full bipolar disorder, but that's, I suspect, is an overdiagnosis. Um, hallucinations are a symptom of bipolar disorder, but it seems that Schumann's hallucinations only occurred in his very final years of his life and are more likely to be effect of the syphilis or even of the mercury poisoning. Um, whether Schumann's illness was cyclothymia or full-blown bipolar disorder, it remains the case that he showed extraordinarily productive creativity in years in which he experienced highly elevated mania-like moods while in other periods he was uh, badly depressed and was largely or entirely unproductive. So, um, so look, yeah, here, let, we can do some more sharing of stuff. Um, so uh, let's go back to this. Let's then have, uh, we're talking about Schumann, there he is. Wonderful, Schumann. Um, okay, and so this is the chart that uh, is reproduced by, I can't remember who produced it. Anyway, um, uh, it reoccurs in one of Jameson's um, more popular papers, eh? Um, so, look, you can see, so these uh, along the bottom are the years of uh, Schumann's adult life. Um, and he died in uh, 54, I think it is, that's right. Um, and um, you can see that there are years where he was hugely productive. Uh, that's the same, uh, 1840 and 1849. Um, years when he was unproductive, uh, such as you know, 1840, um, 44. Um, okay, so yeah, and all right, so that's. Um, Left he died in 1856, that's right. So there's some years at the end here that sort of not mentioned where he was still alive, but completely unproductive. Um, like as he was in, 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 in uh, 1844, whereas in 18, 1840 and 1849, he was just hugely productive. So in um, 1840, he wrote over 130 songs. He wrote almost only songs in, in, in uh, that uh, that year. Um, okay, um, so yeah, and not only, yeah, and, and in particular, you know, they're not just loads of songs, but they were some of you know, the greatest pieces of music ever written. So the great masterpiece song cycles, the Dichter Liebe and Frauen Liebe und Leben, um, were produced in this year. But you see, see just a few years later, in 1844, he was severely depressed and wrote nothing at all. Um, the same period we see, the same pattern we see really occurring you know, here between 49 and, and 54 and thereafter. Uh, the 54 is the year of his suicide attempt. He wrote almost nothing and he lived for another two years after that. Um, so you know, there's clearly a connection between the course of Schumann's illness and his creative productivity. Um, Andreasen suggests in Romanticist vein that Affective disorder may produce some cultural advantages for society as a whole, in spite of the individual pain and suffering it causes. So, so we benefit from you know, the, the, the disorder that, that plagued uh, Schumann. Um, it sort of implies that Schumann would have produced fewer works or works of lesser quality had he not suffered from this cyclothymia. It's very difficult to say whether that's true. Um, you know, had he not been ill, and had he been able to produce work at a steadier rate, maybe his rate of output would have been greater than the average between you know, these you know, 
good years and bad years. But maybe he would have produced less, who knows? Certainly it's worth saying that the oeuvre of those other two great song composers of the, of the 19th century, Hugo Wolf and Henri Dupart, uh, who were both severely mentally ill, were very limited in extent. You know, so he you know, might well have produced uh, even less if he had he been even more mentally uh, ill. Um, um, so regarding quality, uh, one might remark that his output in 1842, so we're talking about two years after you know, the super verbally productive 1840 and two years before the unproductive depressed year of 1844, that year um, is um, the year that included his chamber masterpieces, the piano quintet in E flat and the piano quartet in E flat. Um, and what those pieces show, and is also shown by the years of the compositions of his symphonies, which is 1841, uh, 1845 uh, to 46. So, you, so either side, you, after that manic year and before that manic year, and you, you, after the manicness had dropped off, but not so far as the depression or before you know, right now he's back on his feet, but before he's manic again. Those years, in 1850, those are the years in which he wrote his, his symphonies and the, his great secular oratorio, Das Paradis und die Peri. So it's curious that, that, that Schumann did not compose large scale works in these manic, two manic years. You know, all songs in that year, songs, short piano, you know, piano pieces, um, um, and short chamber works, the pieces you know, for, for, for soloist and piano, works that could be completed in a, you know, just a few days or, or, or in a day. Um, it, the longer, um, yeah, it seems that, that um, the mental state of euphoric excitement and intense feeling doesn't lend itself to the more considered architectural approach to composition that longer and larger pieces demand. So how about how one feels about the effect of Schumann's illness on the quality of his work might depend upon how much one regrets the lack of a fifth symphony. That's to say, Schumann is relatively unusual amongst the greatest composers of the 19th century in that so large a proportion of his work consists of short pieces. It's plausible that this preponderance is an effect of his cyclothymia, whether that's per se a good thing or not is a matter of aesthetic judgment. Okay, so um, the case of Schumann, and uh, likewise other individual artists who suffered from an affective disorder, is suggestive uh, regarding a possibly interesting link between affective mental illness and creativity, but on its own it shows uh, very little. So a more systematic study is required to draw a firmer conclusion. So that's one now I'm going to talk about K. Redfield Jameson's um, very highly cited paper Disorders and Patterns of Creativity in British Writers and Artists, which looks at 47 then uh, living and high achieving British writers and artists. Uh, it looked at whether these individuals had ever been treated for an effective mental illness, bipolar disorder, depression. Um, and it also asked subjects about uh, observed, if any, diurnal and seasonal patterns in their moods and productivity behavioural, cognitive and mood correlates of their periods of creative work and the perceived role of very intense moods in their work. Uh, okay, so there's that second bit, which is about correlating their, 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 their moods with their periods of creativity. So we look we're, you know, a bit like the, the Schumann case. You know, can, can we see a correlation there? Um, in Schumann's case, we get the evidence from his, from his letters. Um, so Jameson found that 38.3% of the subjects she looked at had been treated for an effective illness. Uh, she also found that a large proportion of the subjects had experienced severe mood swings or extended elevated mood states. These are states with characteristics closely related to hyperphania. Furthermore, Jameson reports that they are linked to the subjects' periods of creativity and that there are several seasonal connections between the subject's mood states and their creative productivity. Well, I'm going to not, not focus on that a little bit. 
of that seasonal variation. Um, despite the fact that Jameson's work is rather more systematic than the work that preceded it, it's still difficult to draw clear conclusions from it. The first problem concerns the choice of subjects. Um, while we know that those studied met, meet certain conditions showing high achievement in the literary and artistic world, and we know that, but we don't know how they were selected from the entire cohort of writers and artists meeting those conditions. So for example, uh, Jameson's subjects included eight artists. These artists, painters and sculptors, were selected with either all royal academicians or associates of the Royal Academy. Um, currently, there, at the time, there was an upper limit of 50 uh, on the number of Royal Academicians, so you're a pretty select group, and now it's 80. Um, and the associates of the Royal Academy are typically younger artists who might go on to become Royal Academicians. So how are the eight artists who are studied selected from the 50 plus who would have met the inclusion criteria? So Jameson's study just doesn't say. But of course, this information is crucial to understanding what her data reveal. For example, imagine that the eight were selected because they were the ones, and this is implausible, it's a, what I'm about to say is it seems to me to be the most likely way in which they, they were included. But imagine they were the ones who responded to a letter sent to all Royal Academicians and uh, ARAs, um, inviting participation in the study that requires a considerable amount of the subject's time that would look at the relationship between mental illness, mood, creativity, and genius. Now, then it would be conceivable that those who responded were those who felt that they had something interesting to offer, and so were more likely to be those who had experienced mental illness or intense mood states. We don't know whether this is the case, which is simply not told. Um, and clearly there are other ways uh, in which subjects could have been selected, but you, most of those would have biased the sample also. Indeed, it's quite difficult to see what method of selection wouldn't be potentially biased. One couldn't rely on unbiased random sampling, since presumably Jameson could not compel a randomly selected Royal Academician to participate. Um, for Jameson's results to be informative regarding creativity, the rate of mental illness or intense mood states amongst creative individuals must be compared to those who are not creative or who are markedly less creative. Jameson compares her subjects to the general population, and certainly there is a significant difference in the rate of treatment for mental illness. Um, but is the general population the appropriate comparison group? Poets, novelists, biographers, painters, and sculptors differ from the general population in many ways, other than by being creative. They will typically be better educated than the general population and will be more likely to be belong to a higher you know, uh, social class. Uh, they will be uh, more likely to be self-employed. Um, so an appropriate group uh, with which to compare these British artists would be another section of the British population that's well-educated, that belongs to higher social class and which is self-employed, but for which creativity is not a central professional attribute. Okay, so question. Yeah, we, we think of a group that's like that, like the, these artists, except by not being essentially creative in their profession, but they're self-employed, educated, um, articulate, um, uh, yeah, and so forth. Come up with one. City bankers. Good, okay. That's, that, that's, I did think of that. That was one of the classes I was gonna look at. Yes, another one. I think there are a lot of people working in the in, like uh, informatic yeah, like yeah. programming sector. Yeah, yeah that's but, right. But um, um, you, you guys should think that there's an obvious one for this class. Anyway, the one I, group I was thinking of was, was, uh, was uh, GPs, general practitioners, um, because they're self-employed, they're well-educated, um, they um, I usually can't, you know, regard them as you know, belonging to you know, uh, the higher, higher social statuses, or at least you know, higher isn't the right word, I, mean, I don't think it's a proper word, but anyway, yeah, that end of things. Um, 
and yeah, it's not really creativity is not a selection criterion for being being a GP. I mean, imagine it might help, but it's not something that is you know, regarded as a central criterion for for being a GP. Um, I mean, I, I guess you know, I guess many people don't who aren't GPs or aren't, aren't British doctors anyway don't realise that British GPs are are self-employed, but they are. Um, anyway, so. Uh, actually, you, you're right. Uh, the, these other areas are ones that I was going to look at, uh, particularly the uh, the, the, the finance uh, industry. Um, but anyway, the GPs, it's easier to get the data on. Um, so a 2018 study showed that around 40% of those responding to a survey of GPs reported a serious mental health condition, such as depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, and post-traumatic stress disorder. Okay. So that 40% is a similar number to the 38.5% of artists uh, who uh, had sought um, help for mental health condition in Jameson studies. Now, of course, that's not directly comparable. So um, there are a study of GPs asked about self reports of mental health, health condition or mental illness, whereas Jameson asked about treatment for such conditions, which is a more stringent standard. Nonetheless, 77% of the GPs said with such a condition said that they would seek help from a professional colleague. So that means about 30% you know, of those sampled um, you know, said they had or would seek help from a professional colleague for a mental health condition. Okay, so yeah, 30%, 38.5%, you know, 30% of doctors, 38.5% of artists, or at least of those surveyed who rep replied to the survey, but th that's probably the same in both cases. So, yeah, um, yeah I mean, I don't think either study is you know, super duper scientific, but the point is, um, you know, those numbers are in the same you know, rough ballpark. So, the data that Jameson herself provides uh, doesn't show that creative individuals are more likely to suffer, you know, it doesn't prove that they're, that they're more likely to suffer mental illness than others who are like them, but who are less creative. When the data about British GPs is added, then the hypothesis that there is no significant difference between the creative individuals and their less creative peers becomes at least plausible. Or, you know, I'm not, but I'm not complaining, claiming it's been proven. Okay, so that, yeah, I think that there are, you know, that there's, yeah, that bit of her study uh, about treatment for mental illness is suggestive, but you know, it doesn't, yeah, prove anything. So the other bit of her study, um, she, she states that the study revealed many overlapping mood, cognitive, and behavioral, uh, behavioral especially sleep, sleep changes between hypermania and intense creative states. Um, so remember, a hypermania is a condition that's less intense than and lacks some of the behavioral features of uh, mania, um, yeah, lacks psychosis in particular. Um, there isn't precise agreement as what. Well, Count constitutes hypermania, but yeah, he, he, I'll do some sharing and we'll have a look at a couple of uh, lists. Um, uh, so let's the Schumann stuff. So here's our two lists of the criteria for um, hypermania. One is given by the mental health charity Mind. Um, the DSM uh, list is on the, the right. Um, according to the DSM, um, um, DSM says that hypermania is a state of abnormally and persistently elevated, expansive or irritable mood um, and abnormally or, and persistently increased energy or activity. So, so in some ways, so there are already criteria or symptoms involved in the sort of preamble, you know, abnormally and persistently elevated, expansive or irritable mood and energy and activity, um, plus three of the of the those in the list, or four if you if you're just if you're just grumpy, then you have to have four of those to be having a hypermania. Um, okay, um, so. So I keep you, those are the looks, looks. So I mean, having a look at those lists, you, you, it's interesting because hypermania seems to have a lot of positive features, you know, such as a sense of well-being or being more active and energetic than uh, usual. 
Yeah, so it's only classed as a disorder as these, because of his negative features, the irritability, agitation, inability to concentrate, spending money excessively, and so forth. Um, yeah, so it's those features that can you know, that make it a a, um, a disorder. Um, though it's worth pointing out that uh, on this view, you take, take the DSM view, uh, someone could be diagnosed with hypermania because they have an extended period of abnormally elevated mood, accompanied by needing less sleep, being more talkative, and working intensely. Um, so actually, you know, one could be Strictly speaking, one could be diagnosed with hypermania only on the basis of symptoms that one might regard as entirely, or at least normally, very, very positive, um, with nothing harmful uh, at all. Um, so, you know, it's, sort of, it, it's questionable you know, what kind of disorder hypermania is, given that one can have it you know, with no disordered uh, symptoms. Uh, at all. Um, and in fact, it's worth you pointing out that, um, yeah, that, that some of these features are ones that you aren't found at all in the, um, in the creative people that Redfield Jameson uh, she, that she discusses. So, for instance, me being easily distracted, unable to, to uh, concentrate and so forth. Well, actually, you, the, the, what the creative types finds is entirely the opposite, that they are utterly focused. So it's this, uh, this criterion here that's an increase in goal-directed activity at uh, 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 work. So they have that and you aren't suffering from distractibility or, or lack of concentration. You know, deep. <laughs> yeah. If it's problematic at all, it's the opposite problem. You know, they can't be distracted from their their, their whack work and and um, you know, can't be persuaded to eat their meals or or engage in normal social activity. Okay, um, so you know, what I'm suggesting is well, there are three things that I think that we could take away from Jameson's study at the moment. First, the hypermania type characteristics um, that act that. You know, so, so, uh, yeah, here we go. So these are the these are some of the characteristics. So she gives a gives a list of about twenty four characteristics that are associated with high productivity. And what she does, and you will see the the chart, I think, in the the paper. She lists them uh, and gives actually a nice graph in order of how frequently um, her creative artists uh, reported having these feelings. Um, during periods of high creativity. And so it's listed from the most frequently cited to the least frequently. And so this is the top half of the list. So enthusiasm was cited by very many of the people in their most creative periods. Halfway down the list is sensory awareness. Um, and, yeah, and, and, and then, then there's 12 other things that she says, but that's where all the negative stuff is. You look at this list of the things that are most frequently reported as by these artists you know, when they're particularly productive. Enthusiasm, energy, self-confidence, speed of mental associations. It's all you know, entirely positive stuff. Um, um, you know, there, you know, the things that are at the bottom of the list, there were increases in restlessness, irritability, drinking, anxiety, and argumentativeness. There were increases in those things, but much less than increases in these things. Um, okay, so according to uh, famous writers about uh, creativity, uh, Hills and Bird, um, the defining features of creativity are originality, imagination, motivation, and uh, fertility. Um, now, some of the very symptoms of hypermania um, are um, associated with um, you know, with the with, with uh, creativity, like uh, fluency of thought. Uh, so, some of these features here: your fluency of thought, um, uh, um, expansiveness, and feelings, and so forth. So, it, so there's a worry here that um, 
you, that the characteristics to which Jameson is referring as indicative of hypermania. So she says that these are her criteria of you know, fit with hypermania. But see, these things that are most that are hypermania-like characteristics that she refers to, in particular, sort of fluency of thought, speed of mental association. Uh, emotional intensity, sensory awareness, you, particularly if you're thinking about a, a, uh, uh, um, a composer or a sculptor or a painter, um, expansiveness in ideas. You know, these are all features, as it were, that are, yeah, um, almost, I, I would say, a priori linked with the concept of creativity as you know, I, I and Alison Hills have uh, defined it. Um, so in some ways it becomes, turns out to be a priori that there is a link between um, these quasi-hypermanic states and creativity. Um, I mean it's not that if one's in a hypermanic state one therefore will be more creative, but you know, normally speaking, it's a priori that it's normally speaking, you, know, you we would expect someone who is already creative to be more creative if they are having this kind in this kind of state. So it's a little bit like saying this. Um, it's like the claim that as an athlete who is in peak physical condition, who feels more confident, who is focused on their race, is more likely to win than an athlete who is not in peak condition. Look, there's no guarantee uh, that such an athlete will win. So it's not a priori that they will win, but it is a priori that they are normally more likely to win. Um, so in that sense, if it's a priori, there's this connection comes correspondingly, you less informative about you know, whether there is an you know, interesting link between uh, a, a disordered state, disordered versus common state like hypermania uh, and creativity. Um, it turns out to be trivial. And final thought is um, that you know, you, you know, a lot of this looks like you know, what we would colloquially call you know, being in the zone, or as Michele, uh, oh crikey, what's his name is, uh, of that Hungarian bloke whose name is extraordinarily long and impossible to uh, pronounce, uh, the flow, the guy who talks about flow. Um, that seems to be uh, yeah, it's characterized by this list. So, but that also applies, of course, not only to creative people, but you know, others, most obviously uh, sports people. And I think that you know, this, <laughs> this list seems appropriate, not specifically to creativity, except insofar as it's a priori linked with creativity, but really to any field which requires the exercise of skill. Okay, so that's what I'm saying. So I mean, I've given you some reasons thinking I think Jameson's uh, study is a bit more problematic. I won't repeat them in the interest of time. So just a quick conclusion you'll be pleased to hear. Okay, so um, I've been considering first the value or otherwise of anecdotal evidence in making a link between mental illness and creativity. That's low grade evidence, you know, cherry picking and bias all over the place. Um, then we've looked at um, a bit more of a more systematic study uh, carried out on living creative individuals. You know, that's clearly it offers the potential to be higher quality. Um, yeah, although it's suggestive, methodological problems mean that it's difficult to draw any interesting conclusions from this work with a high degree of confidence. It's not easy to see how any study could provide a very great deal of strong evidence uh, for its conclusions since you know, this, this area is so susceptible to different, several different kinds of uh, bias. It's difficult to eliminate that. Um, okay, um, so um, and I think several of the problems I've been alluding to afflict research into um, mental health and its correlates in general. Um, many behaviors and for that matter emotions as well are susceptible to cultural influence 
Um, so one researcher points to a number of suicides amongst subjects in one study as indicative of a relationship between creativity you know, amongst those subjects and um, and their mental illness. Uh, yeah, and indeed, um, suicide is a symptom of mental illness, according to the uh, DSM. Um, in the DSM-5, it raises the possibility of suicidal behavior disorder being a, it's a disorder in its own right and, and you know, having its own entry in future editions of the DSM. Um, yet, while suicide can certainly indicate depression, it's strongly susceptible to cultural influences. Emil Durkheim showed that suicide was less frequent in Catholic than in Protestant countries. Now that's consistent with the mental illness view of suicide, since that it's plausible that anomie, which he was looking as the cause, is greater, you know, which is greater in Protestant countries, at least so he argued, and is a cause of depression. You could sort of see that link. On the other hand, another explanation is that Catholics, regarding suicide as a sin, are more reluctant to call themselves than Protestants. So that would explanation would make suicide or a suicide rate in part a cultural phenomenon. More directly relevant to our question is the Werther effect, uh, in which a well publicized, publicized suicide uh, leads to so called copycat suicides, as occurred after the death of Marilyn Monroe. So, so the effect, as you'll know, is named after the hero or main character of Goethe's epistolary novel, Die Leiden des Jungen Werthers, in which the hero shoots himself with a pistol at the end of an unhappy uh, love affair. Following the publication of the book, numerous young men emulated in reality the fictional Werther's suicide. Werther fever, as it was known at the time, led to a panic amongst some authorities, and the book was even banned in some countries, such as Denmark. So the publication of the book uh, led to an increase in the key symptom of depression. And indeed, if there were a diagnosis of suicidal behavior disorder, there would be an ipso facto increase in one, this mental disorder. But it sort of seems odd to think that the publication of the book really did increase the prevalence of mental disorder. It's a cult, what's going on here is uh, in part a cultural phenomenon. Um, so, okay, so I've only considered uh, the possible relationship between affective disorders and mental illness. I briefly mentioned uh, that it's important to look at schizophrenia and related disorders, but I haven't actually done that uh, yet. There seems to be some evidence of a link there, although weaker even than for affective disorder. But you know, that might be more interesting to look at because at least it's first conceivable, it's more conceivable that um, those illnesses might have an effect on the imagination. Um, for even if there is a link between affective disorder and creativity, it doesn't look to be one that confirms the romanticist hypothesis that madness and conditions that are similar to madness promote creative imagination by freeing it from constraints uh, and examples. So if there is any such connection, we've got to look for it elsewhere, but I haven't done that yet. And it's a pretty well exactly uh, six o'clock, so I shall shut up now and see whether you people have anything interesting to offer, which I am sure you have. Okay, that's me, done. Over to you.